Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. A quick word before we get into this episode. As you guys know, this book, The Woman with the Alabaster Jar, has been a very tough book for me to get through. And a lot of it is because a lot of the information in this book is just not correct. And I've been very curious as to why God, why it's source, why Magdalene wanted us to look at this book, even though some of this information is not correct. So I've been asking that as of late. And the answer I got was because in our community, in the seeker community, the truther community, whatever you want to call this community, we have to understand where we have also been brainwashed. There is a lot of mind control that has happened in our community as well. In our French community, we know 90% of the people involved in this community are infiltrators. And their job is to put out junk conspiracy. Now, I'm not saying that Margaret Starbird, the writer of this book, is that. But I do, I am aware now that when she wrote this book, she was basing her findings off of junk conspiracy. And if we are to practice discernment in our search for the truth, this is something we have to be aware of. So that is why I believe in this moment, Magdalene and Source wanted us to go through this book so that we learn that discernment, so that we don't take everybody's word for it. We learn how to think for ourselves. So with that being said, on with the show. Right, let's get started with the 12th century awakening. This version of the Christian story we are examining is not taught in established Christian churches, yet it may be closer to the truth than the Orthodox version. In fact, there were numerous early versions of Christianity that did not survive. For example, the Church of Jerusalem, of which Jesus' brother James was the first leader, remained very Jewish in orientation and did not equate Jesus with God. Well, again, his name was Joshua. And yes, we've talked about this. This was covered in the Gospel of the Nazarene Way. Um, wherever the real Jerusalem is located, um, when Yeshua left that area, he left it with his brother. And Yeshua never said he was God. We have to remember that Constantine made Yeshua God, or Jesus God, at the Council of Nicaea, which was a complete slap across the face of those who were practicing the early versions of Christianity and was seen probably, if I can imagine, as a very satanic twist on something that was not satanic, making a human being a deity. The Christian community in Jerusalem remained loyal to the temple and to the Torah of Judaism. But again, we must remember Yeshua nor his brother were actually Jewish. James and Peter, the two permanent leaders of the Jerusalem community, were demonstrably disturbed by the version of Christianity taught by Paul. In Paul's epistles and in the book of Acts, we find evidence that these two apostles repudiated some of Paul's teachings. The followers of Paul's version of Christianity eventually began to speak scornfully of the family of Yahshua and of the original band of apostles who they felt had not fully understood Yeshua. Uh, Mike, Michael from the Enough is Enough channel has a huge story about Paul. And so I am considering bringing him on this channel to talk about Paul. None of these people are who we think 
they are. But again, with all transparency, as you saw in the beginning of this video, I know that God, Source, Magdalene wants us to look at this because we want to understand what junk conspiracy is. So the whole foundation of Margaret Starbird's book here is based off of lies. So again, we have to understand that Yeshua was not Jewish. There would have been no need to have the Torah in his teachings because he himself was Egyptian. He and Magdalene were of the priests and priesthoods of Isis, otherwise known as the Essenes. We also know that Yeshua was never crucified. So we already see the faulty junk conspiracy in this because it's built on a house of cards. The foundation is not solid. This position is suggested in Mark's gospel where the family and friends of Yahshua consider him to have gone mad. The gospel writers also state that Yahshua chide the apostles for being obtuse. Peter especially is singled out for having misunderstood the necessity for the, the crucifixion and for having denied Jesus three times on the night of his arrest, which none of that happened. None of that actually happened. That's all made up. And that's another fallacy that Margaret Starbird has based her research off. She's basing her research off the Bible. And we know this is fact. The Bible has been edited like 55 times. And we know that King James made up a huge portion of the Bible. So that would be like me basing my whole life story off of fairy tales, right? It, it, does, it doesn't stand as factual evidence. It's nothing but a story. Many Christologies developed in the early church. Heated struggles between factions continued for centuries. With the disbanding of the Christian community in Jerusalem following the Jewish revolt in 66-74 ID, there were no authoritative versions of Christianity that could claim to be the only authentic faith. Eventually, some sects were driven out of the church while others compromised. The Ebonites, close spiritual descendants of the early Jerusalem community of James and Peter, were later branded heretical because of their low Christianology, did not attribute divinity to the historical Jesus of Nazareth. Well, neither Margaret Starberg does your research actually match the actual yeshua he was not jesus of nazareth that person is completely made up he was yeshua of egypt the records and teachings of the deviant sects and factions have not survived the centuries in many cases in many cases the only mention of radical teaching is found in the polemic of one or another of the church fathers who wish to expose their error the first four centuries of the church were marked with turmoil, persecution, and heterox interpretations. The Council of Nicaea that I just spoke about proclaimed that Jesus was the only begotten son of the Father, light from the light, true God from true God, of being with the Father. This became the orthodox creed of the empire, and no variations were tolerated. Exactly, I just said it was Constantine and the Council of Nicaea that made Yeshua a god. He was never a god. Missionaries of this creed set out to convert heathen tribes in remote corners of Europe, preaching the Gospels as mandated by their Lord Jesus and baptizing in the name of the, their Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Following the edict of Emperor Theodosius that declared Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire in AD 380, versions of Christianity did not, that did not agree with the newly empowered hierarchy of bishops were ruthlessly persecuted and their teachings destroyed. Well, that... That does make sense. And this makes sense, you guys. I have such a hard time recording this because every time I record from this book, I end up with a migraine. And we know that the truth resonates and lies do not. So that is my body's way of confirming that everything or probably, if I'm going to guess, 75% of this book is completely false. The next section is called the Dark Ages, which we know the Dark Ages is just a fancy word for they don't want us to know about Tartaria. The general pillage and turmoil of the period between the 4th and 10th centuries in Europe, wrought by the sweep of barbarian tribes, the Franks, Visigoths, Celts, Hungs, and even Norse, led to a relative dearth of written records of the area. There is also some evidence that that the records that did exist were deliberately expunged during the period that we now call the Dark Ages. Margaret Starbird. 
If you study the Cassiopeians, they will tell you that a thousand years of our history has been added in. That there's a thousand years of history that they've made up that didn't actually happen. So what did happen? Tartaria. The area they call, or the time period they call the Dark Ages, was the time of Tartaria. That's the controller's way of telling you they're darkening it out so that you don't know what really happened during that time. But I do understand, Margaret, that you wrote this during a time when we weren't, we had no access to the information of Tartaria. So I do understand that at the time you wrote this, you thought you were on the fringe of the truth, but really you were just playing into the junk conspiracy that was created by the same controllers who destroyed the teachings of Yahshua. Most of the Western European barbarian tribes were originally converted to the Ar Arian heresy, a form of Christianity articulated by a 4th century native of Alexandria who found himself eminently commanded at the Council of Nicaea. The Arian heresy denied the doctrines of the Holy Trinity and the divinity of Jesus, instead preaching the existence of an all-powerful all God and his son, a fully human Jesus, which is more along the lines of the truth. This version of Christianity was widespread in Western Europe during the 5th and 6th century. The history of the Dark Ages has been painstakingly reconstructed with the aid of documents found in monasteries and cloisters and through numerous finds by archaeologists. No, no. There's more evidence of Tartaria. By these means, the tragic history of the obscured Merovingian kings has been brought to light. Shidluk III, the last of the legitimate Merovingian kings, was deposed in AD 571 by Pepin, the royal steward whose descendants through his grandson Charlemagne became known as the Carolinians. The title of Holy Roman Empire was conferred on Charlemagne by the Pope on Christmas Day in AD 800. During his reign, Charlemagne encouraged arts and letters, including the copying and preserving of manuscripts. Those who lived in this period did not call it dark. Yeah, well, the Merovingians, who were the descendants of Magdalene, because she was the actual bloodline being Atlantean, were the rulers of Tartaria. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Again, this is why I get such a bad headache reading this shit, because it's just lies. It's all lies. I don't know if Margaret Starver is still alive. And if she's watching this, I, I do want you to know, like, I understand you didn't know that you were feeding into the controllers when you wrote this book to try to keep us away from the truth. Of course, of course, the controllers are in the truth of world. Of course they are. They're 90% of the truthers are infiltrators. This is what we call junk conspiracy. This book is junk conspiracy. It's not real. It's junk. It's just as fake as the Bible. It's just as fake as the story of the church. But Nonetheless, we're going to go through it. The great European centers of civilization during this era were Celtic Ireland, Moorish Spain, and the Mediterranean coast of what is now France. No. We are most concerned with the latter, since that is the seedbed of the legend and the heresy of the Sangral. No. This region was known interchangeably as Octinia, the Landoc, and the Midi. Today, it is most commonly called Provence. No, the seedbed of Magdalene and Yahshua is here in the Americas. The Gaul that's spoken about with them is Canada. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. The Cradle of the Awakening. A number of students of European history are agreed that the first real awakening from the Dark Ages in Europe was not the 15th century Renaissance, as is usually assumed, but rather certain events that occurred in the southern France in the 12th century. Tomes have been written on the influence of the Crusades, the cross-fertilization of ideas of the East and West, the impact of Muslim art and thought of this region, and the rise of craftspeople and the middle-class bourgeoisie. But Provence has been an area of relative enlightenment and progress for centuries prior to the Crusades, pursuing a lively interest in Islamic and Jewish religion, arts, and literature, and tolerating new ideas in science and philosophy. The openness to diversity fostered in the Midi 
a sophistication unmatched in the northern countries of the continental Europe. No, not true. Perhaps the most important of all the many profound social changes in the 12th century Europe was a growing appreciation of the feminine. Remember, this time period she's talking about was Tartaria. So during Tartaria, there was a balance between the feminine and the masculine. And if you take the feminine away, the divine feminine away, you always you also take away the divine masculine because both interlive with each other. This radical shift was rooted in Provence, where practices were at striking variance with the rest of the medieval world. Basically, the medieval attitude at this time was misogynistic. No. Hostility towards women was founded on the stated position of the church fathers, which was in part based on the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The writings of the Christian patriarchs, most notably those of the 5th century saints, Augustine of Hippo and Jerome, viewed women as morally and spiritually inferior to men. Later theologians even debated whether or not a woman could be said to have a soul. Woman's sex and the human body, along with the earthly pleasures, were officially regarded as distractions and temptations that could lure men away from the spiritual path. Yeah, so this is the brainwashing they're doing to make us believe that for centuries leading up to this, one gender was less than the other. This is not actually what happened. I, I feel like I'm kind of preaching to the choir right now. We know that this didn't actually happen, that this that the, the, the degrading of women happened way closer to the mudbloods, way closer to the start of Gog and Magog and was set into our records as something that had been happening for many centuries in order for us to be brainwashed into a system. But did this actually happen? No, it didn't. The beliefs regarding women, women held by most of the Christian world in the medieval times were rad, radically dualistic. The material world, the flesh, the devil, and women were lumped together as a source of evil that kept men from attaining spiritual union with God. In order to free the soul for spiritual pursuits, these evils had to be denied and overcome. Desires of the flesh were to be scorned and ignored if possible. The views of St. Augustine had enormous influence on the attitudes towards women and sex, and they seemed to reflect the influence of the Manichean her heresy named for its founder, Manny, who died in AD 277. Augustine was an inherit of this heresy until his conversion to Christianity at the age of 31, after a year of debauchery. Manny had taught the God of the Old Testament was a demigod who created the world and all its evils, entrapping pure spirits in the prison of human flesh. That goes along the lines with what I understand to be true as well. Uh, well, the God of the, the God of the Bible in general, not just the Old Testament, is Lucifer, which we will get into greater detail. I'm sure when we start talking about the New Testament. It's, it's the same God. It's not a different God in the Old Testament, and the New Testament. But yeah, we talked about with Mr. Fox the organic portals trapping souls into human flesh. So that makes sense. Women, quite, quite logically, were considered prime agents of the preparation of the miseries of the physical world and conceptions of children was necessarily discouraged by followers of Manny. Augustine went on after his uh, conversion to become a permanent interpreter of Catholic doctrine and scripture, bringing with him remnants of his formal dualistic worldview and basic misogyny. In medieval Europe, women had no legal rights and were the wards of their fathers or husbands. They were excluded from the civic life of their society and, and owned no property. They were mere chattel. The only significant exception to this was the attitude toward women among the people of southern France. There, along with men, women held many fields and manners by right of inheritance as early as the 10th century. The reason for this may have been the people's strong ties to egalitarian Roman practices or to even more ancient tribal traditions. But I suspect that there was an even more obvious reason. Since the dawn of Christianity, this area had a strong history of honoring women. During the 11th and 12th centuries, the women of Provence were held in a specific and especially high regard. A classic example of the liberated woman in the middle was Eleanor of Aquitaine. That's what I was just, whose notoriety and power plays a wife and mother of the king shook Europe for decades. But Eleanor of Aquitaine was actually a descendant of the Merovingians. Okay, and the area they're talking about here is the southeast where I live. The southeast, 
say what you want about it, whatever brainwashing or programming you've been, been given to think about the Southeast of the United States of America, but it was the first place really in the modern world to give women rights. This was the first place to allow to allow a woman to inherit her father's estate without the aid of her brother or her husband. Okay. Eleanor of Aquitaine was a descendant of the Merovingians. And when the fall of Tartaria happened, she was sold into the royal families in order to try to infiltrate the bloodline of Atlantis. We've talked about this. This is nothing new on this channel. Does this give you guys a headache too? Because it, it just gives me a headache every time. This is just hogwash. I would not, I mean, I'm glad we're reading this book because we're getting to see the junk conspiracy, but I would absolutely never recommend this book to anyone for any truth whatsoever. I wouldn't censor it, but I wouldn't recommend it. The Crusades are often cited as the catalyst for the reawakening of the culture of Europe after a long period dubbed the Dark Ages, but Provence had maintained an enlightened relationship with the Moorish and Jewish centers of learning in Spain and North Africa for several hundred years prior to the Crusades, and its flourishing culture had been influenced by this openness. In fact, much of the area of Provence had been included in the 8th century Jewish kingdom of Septimania under Guillaume of Galome, a Jewish prince of Merovingian descent. No. No, honey. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being Jewish, obviously. There's nothing wrong with it. But the Merovingians were Atlanteans, as Magdalene was not Margaret. Margaret! Margaret! As a researcher, you should know better than this. How did they spell Isis back in that time? They spelled Isis E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. What religion, what faith were Yeshua and Magdalene born into? The Essenes, the priests and priesthood of Isis. They were Egyptian. I don't understand why these researchers find it so important to try to erase the truth of the Egyptian heritage. That's our heritage. That's the Atlantean heritage. It's not some culture of the past. It's the culture I live. It's the culture you live. We are Atlanteans, aka Egyptians. That's why all the holographics had all the different races in the Egyptian pantheon. So I don't understand this need to try to make Magdalene and Yahshua a different religion, a different race. I don't understand it. Yes, they had Jewish disciples. They had Jewish students. But they were not Jewish. It's as clear as day. So why do we feel like we need to? That's what narcissists do. That's what psychopaths do. They rewrite history to change the narrative. Magdalene and Yahshua were Egyptian. They were not Jewish. Again, there's nothing wrong with being Jewish, but they were not. That's not the truth of who they were. At the same area have been the center of a cult of Mary Magdalene for centuries, a wit as witness the numerous chapels, fountain springs, and other geographical landmarks in that region that bear her name. She was the patron saint of gardens and vineyards throughout the region. The mediatrix of fertility, beauty, and the joy of life. Hers were the more ancient dominions of the love goddess of antiquity. It was not accidental that the cult of the rose, an anagram of Eros, flourished and bloomed in the Garden of Provence. And if you, I'm not on Facebook anymore. I had to close a lot of my social media. The only social media I've left is Instagram because of a certain coven that was started threatening my nephew and niece's lives. So I had to close down a lot of my social media because of that. Again, 90% of the truthers are infiltrators. Um, but when I was on Facebook, there is a Tartaria group and they have pictures of them moving artifacts. 
So the south of France that we know it today at the Mediterranean, those artifacts you find there are not from there. They were moved to, to, to trick you, to feed you junk conspiracy. This all happened on the American continent. Why do you think Mr. T said America first? That had multiple, multiple meanings. One is the president. He had to look after us first. We're his people. But because the American continent is the first continent, it all happened here. Why do you think there's been such a smear campaign on America? If you're not American, think about your country. Have you ever said stupid Americans? Have you, were you taught to look down on Americans and on the American country? Have you ever asked yourself why that was? Why that smear campaign started? Maybe it was so you wouldn't take this continent seriously. Because maybe in this continent, the truth of who, of who humanity is, our true story, is here, not over there. I know that Thoth's spaceship from the Emerald Tablet that we looked at with Tablet 5 is under Memphis, Tennessee. Of course, the controllers want you looking over to Egypt, where we know Egypt today in Africa, looking for this stuff because you're never going to find it there. It's not there. It's here. Why do you think they can't find Cleopatra's body? Because her body's here. New Orleans is Alexandria. The mighty Mississippi is the Nile. They don't want you looking here. They want you looking out there. They want you to turn to America with disgust. Because all the secrets, everything is here. Okay. When Peter the Hermit, the monk who instigated the first crusade, preached in European towns during the final decade of the 11th century, he argued that it was time for a holy war to win Jerusalem back from the Saracens. He was figuratively speaking, carrying an hourglass. One millennia had passed since the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem by the Romans, who burned it to the ground in AD 70 and laid the city to waste. Peter proclaimed to the towns of Europe that it was time to, re to restore the holy city and rebuild the temple. The secret agenda of Peter the Hermit and his influential friends was to put a descent of David's line on the throne of Jerusalem, thus assisting God in bringing about the prophesied millennium of peace and promise outlined in the Hebrew scriptures. The millennium of peace already happened. That was, again, Tartaria. And if you're trying to put someone of the divinic bloodline on the throne to assist God, what God are you talking about? Because David was a Satanist. That's in the Bible. They have to tell you the truth so that you get their, you give them their, your, you give them your consent. There we go. It tells you David was doing human sacrifice. Yahweh is Moloch. So it seems to me all this stuff is really trying to prepare for the Antichrist, not the thousand years of peace, which did already come. Now we're looking at the ascension because y'all, we're at Gog and Magog. That apocalypse ship already sailed a long time ago. That was the fall of Atlantis. So when we talk about the God of the Bible, we talk about assisting God. You have to ask yourself again, which God are you speaking of? Because for the Luciferians, for the Satanists, Lucifer is their God. And if you're venerating David, if you're venerating King Solomon, if you're venerating Noah, Abraham, Samson, if you're venerating all of these people, you are venerating the controllers, the Rothschilds. It's as clear as day. Welcome to the Great Awakening. Or as Hilla says, the Great Remembering. Because we know this. That's how. That's why I have a headache reading this stuff. It's because I know it's a lie. I know the truth. You know the truth. Okay. All the knights of Europe who could bear arms embarked the Holy Land and some on foot, other in ships. In the year 1099, their dreams at last was realized. The Saracens were defeated. 
and Godfrey of Lorraine, a noble man allegedly of Merovingian lineage, was offered the title Baron of Jerusalem. The group who had orchestrated this agenda seemed satisfied with the results of their political coup. With the scion of David finally restored to Jerusalem, numerous stories, poems, and songs, and eventually the Grail legends themselves began to bloom in abundance. Throughout Christendom, an emerging culture extolled the popular hero Godfrey, the Crusaders, and Our Lady. The seeds of this culture, originally carried to Western Europe by Magdalene, had germinated in the fertile soil of Provence. No. One of the intriguing footnotes from this period of early crusades is the story of the rapid rise and eclipse of a vastly powerful chivalric order of the Knights Templar. This order of warrior clerics was officially formed in the first decade of the 12th century following the recapture of Jerusalem, and it enjoyed the favor of the Pope and the Kings for almost two centuries before its annihilation on the charge of heresy in the opening decades of the 14th centuries. The authors of Holy Blood and Holy Grail researched the origins and the history of the Order of the Knights Templar exhaustively. They concluded it was closely involved with the her heretical sects of Christianity that believed Jesus was fully human and married, and that his royal blood still flowed in the veins of the noble families of Provence, and that this Masonic promise of Hebrew scripture would someday be fulfilled in the descendant of Jesus. Many of the Knights Templar sprang from noble families in Provence, an area that had always held itself aloof from the official doctrines of Rome. So there is some truth with the Knights Templar. They were originally established to protect the bloodline, but they were not established in the way that she's saying they were established. Because it wasn't Yahshua's bloodline. It was Magdalene. It's, not, it's never been about Yahshua, you guys. Do we not see that? It's always been about Magdalene. Yes, he was the divine masculine and she was the divine feminine. They were equal partners, but she was the potent one. She was the teacher of the Christ. Why did it have to be her, not him? Well, let's look at this as a mirror of yourself. Your left nostril is feminine. Your right nostril is masculine. You have both energies in your body. You have divine feminine and you have divine masculine. As a body, I represent the divine feminine. My partner, my twin, is the masculine. But within myself, I also have the masculine and the feminine, and as in himself, he does as well. What does the divine feminine represent in both men and women? Intuition. Empathy, compassion, sensitivity, the arts. The divine feminine is the element of the vitality of life. It's the prana, the life force. Both, again, both men and women have this. But in the representation of the physical bodies, the woman is the one that is the vitality. She holds the vitality of intuition. So when the controllers were sitting around trying to figure out which one of these two they were going to knock off to create the imbalance, they picked Magdalene because she held the power of intuition, the divine connection to God. So by removing Magdalene, making her a prostitute, not the wife of Yeshua, not the equal partner of Yeshua. They took away your ability to connect to your own intuition, to your gut self. Does that make sense? Once you see it, you can't unsee it. That is why when women get their nose pierced, they get it pierced on the left because that's the feminine. If you see a woman with their nose pierced on the right, maybe it was a mistake or maybe they're telling you they're really a man. There is a infiltrator truther who has her nose pierced. It's pierced on the right. And I know for certain she's actually a man. Is that the controller's way of telling you? I don't know. But I hope that makes sense. So the Knights Templar, they were supposed to protect the royal bloodline of Magdalene and Yeshua, the Merovingians, which again is named after Magdalene. But this story got inverted by the controllers and got created into junk conspiracy to confuse you about the real story, about the truth. The Heretics of Provence. The alternative gospel, the Aaron heresy, and later the heresies of the Cathars and the Waldensines flourished through the first 12 centuries of Christianity in this region. 
Although the tenets of the heresies differed, one thing is clear. Provence never wholeheartedly accepted the orthodox versions of Roman Catholicism and its creed. It had its reasons. The term Albingian was coined in AD 1165 after a church council met in the town of Albi to issue, issue an edict condemning the heretics of the Midi, in particular the set called the Cathars. Based on this edict of Albi, the heretics of this entire region are often indiscriminately called the Albingians, regardless of the tenets of the particular heresy to which they adhered. The people of this area had proved themselves tolerant of both Jewish and Moorish cultures, willing to share in their philosophical and esoteric traditions and to criticize the hierarchy of the Roman church. Many of whose clerics, it is widely admitted, were guilty of corruption and abuse during the 11th and 12th centuries. Often there seemed to have been a chasm between their preaching and their practice of the gospel. Some things never change. Same, same. The whole northern coast, washed by the Mediterranean, was in a firmament with the cross-pollinating stimuli of the area, and freedom was a rallying cry. The families of Provence were no allies of the King of France, nor did they wish to be Rome's minions. Their distinguishing feature was their independence. The faith of the Cathars, and it's interesting, I actually, in my opinion, and I don't have any evidence to back this up, I think when we look at all the witch trials, like the Salem witch trials, that that was actually the burning of the Cathars, or the, the real Cathars, which were protecting the bloodline and the inheritance of the Magdalene, they were protecting, so that's kind of my, I think that's where we get the crosshairs, um, but I can't prove that, that's just my own speculation. The faith of the Cathars. The citizens of the region, among whom the Cathar heresy had an even stronger hold in the 12th century, were simple farmers and peasants. They heard the sermons of the itinerant preachers, the Cathari, called the pure ones, who came and worked in their fields, shaved their beard, and preached to them, using them to live their lives, urging them to live their lives in simplicity and humble spirit of Jesus, Yahshua. Known as Credence, they believe their version of Christianity to be both pure and older than Orthodox Christianity, closer to the teachings of Yahshua and the apostles and the Orthodox version of faith. They were often vegetarian, because so was Yahshua, so was Magdalene, and pacifists. They were they did not eat meat in Tartaria, you guys. You guys, eating meat is like, I mean, I don't know anybody who's still eating meat at this point, because we know, we know that eating meat is not, it's not a polite. It's not good. That's not good. We were not created to eat meat. That's the eating of adrenalized blood, basically. You know what I'm saying. So they were often vegetarian and pacifist, practicing a mode of charismatic Christianity similar to that of the early church described in the book of Acts in the New Testament. The new remaining documents that survived the censorship of the Inquisition verify that Cathar's practice of Christianity had roots in both ancient and pure, reflecting the vigor of primitive Christianity at its dawn. But the God of the New Testament is also Lucifer. Make no mistake about this. What's the New Testament all about? The New Testament is all about a human sacrifice to satiate God. That's Lucifer. That's Lucifer, you guys. The Bible is satanic. Doesn't mean the real God is satanic. You just have to separate that. You have to separate the real God from the Bible. The Bible is satanic. Period. End of story. The charges of Manichaeism and radical dualism leveled by the Inquisition against this sect were most likely exaggerated. There is no mention of Manny in any surviving Cathar document. It seems more probable that the ancient roots of Catharism are to be found in first century Christian practices that they sprang from the same apocalyptic dualism as it did in the early Judeo-Christian sects in the dearest community at Qumran. They were not Judeo-Christian. They were Egyptian. The Cathars' interest in the spiritual life and their lack of enthusiasm for the institution of marriage because it condemned the spirit of fleshly existence echoed strongly the beliefs of the apocalyptic Judeo-Christian communities 
of the first century? No. St. Paul? No. 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 And the earliest adherents of the Christian way believed the end of the age was so imminent that there was really no point in getting married. Also, marriage is not what you think it is. The binding contract of marriage in the sense of God and the light is sex. So we have to be careful who you sleep with. Marriage, as we do it in our world, you're actually married to the state. When you marry your husband, you and your husband are marrying the state. So not the same thing. I do not want to go through a marriage ceremony until the controllers are gone because i do not want to be married to the state i could be married to my partner spiritually i mean the only thing that would make me ever get married in the controller's world of being married would be if my partner was from another country and we needed it to get his paperwork here or my paperwork there right like that would be the only reason i would i would do a, a legal marriage so we could stay together. Other than that, I'm not interested because the act itself is you marrying the state. And my friend Tracy and, and me who know all about the vocabulary words and nationalism, all that kind of stuff can, can speak more about that. Marriage in the eyes of God is you committing intimately to your partner, your one and only, your beloved. So when you make love to your partner, no other person, just your partner, then you are married. You are karmically married. You share karma with them. So make no mistake about that. Having a piece of paper given to you by the government literally means nothing in the spiritual world. What means something is your intimate loyalty in connection to your beloved, as Magdalene calls it, your, your, your twin flame, your other soul, your person you've decided to, to commit yourself to, your life to. With that being said, I, I do think it's quite nice to take the same last name. If I were to get married, I would definitely take my partner's last name for sure because that's two becoming one. But I can do that. I could change my last name without actually having a legal document. Anybody can change their name. So, I don't know. Just wanted to bring that up. I think we're very, very confused about marriage in general. A list of the noble families who openly adhere to Cathar faith survived. And this list refutes the change of the, the charge of the inquisitioners that the members of the heretical church tried to undermine the institution of family by condemning marriage or the conception of children. It is likely that they refuse to be wed in orthodox wedding ceremonies, but that many have been on the grounds as they did not consider those ceremonies valid or necessary. For the same reason, they also refused to be baptized of the Holy Roman Church. Well, I asked for my baptism to be revoked because I realized baptism is basically purifying yourself for sacrifice. That's what that means, basically. So you don't need to be baptized. You're not being sacrificed. The Cathari preached a lifestyle of simple living and radical faith in God's continual presence and guidance. One did not have to have ties to Manichaeism to believe that the devil was the prince of this world. Lucifer is the king of this world, guys. He's the, there it is. Yahshua is quoting to have been of that opinion himself. The Cathars may not have been Manichaean so much as close adherence to the literal text of the gospel of which each Cathar family owned a copy. These Al Albigenian heretics, the faith was not a doctrine to believe, but a life to be lived. They called themselves Christians. Fundamental to the teachings of the Church of Love, another name for the alternative church, was a profound devotion to Yahshua, the light bearer, and to his mother and friends. So she used the word Jesus, and I say Yahshua because I don't like disrespecting Yahshua, but... I'm going to read that again, but use Jesus's name and let's talk about this. So fundamental to the teachings of the church and love, another name for the alternative church was a pro profound devotion to Jesus, the light bearer, and to his mother and friends. Who else do we call the light bearer, you guys? Who else is called the light bearer? Lucifer. 
So if Yahshua and Jesus are two different people, we're trying to get you to praise Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. What God are we talking about? Does that make Jesus the Son of Lucifer? And Yahshua was a human being who taught the Christ. If Lucifer is the god of this world, and they want you to worship that God sent his son to be sacrificed, and she's calling Jesus a light bearer, and Lucifer is the light bearer, then riddle me that, Batman. You don't have to be a rocket science scientist. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. While the church in Rome taught obedience to rules and strict practices of its law and prohibitions, the church of Armor, Roma spelled backwards, taught that each individual life must be transformed in holiness by the action of the Holy Spirit in mind and heart. The adherence to this alternative church under Jesus as their prophet, priest, king, and messiah. Messiah means a penis. A fully human agent and anointed son of God. But they understood their role as an eastern vessel for the same Holy Spirit. They were aware of the mythological and mystical contents of Christ's teaching as a path to holiness and transformation, and they were aware of its connections with the entire system of revelation and religious consciousness of the classical world. They did not consider the exoteric practices of dousing and baptism, font, or attendance at a Sunday Mass sufficient for salvation. Their religion was a practice of the presence of God and a daily growth in the virtues of charity, humility, and service to others modeled in the life and teachings of Jesus himself, in the midi, antagonism toward the church was both deep and wide. It was the experience of the people of Provence and indeed in many other places that the hierarchy of the institutional church did not live the gospel message. Clerics often exploited the poor and lived in comparative, comparative luxury while their parishioners starved. The Albigensian sects were distinctly anti-clerical and anti-celestiac. The Cathars formed their own church in opposition to what they believed was the false teachings of Rome. They repudiated the ritual of mass and the cross because of its, it was an instrument of torture, in no way worthy of veneration. They claimed that their own church had retained the Holy Spirit conferred on the original apostles at the Pentecost and passed on the laying of hands. The only ritual that they regarded, the only ritual that they regarded as authentic with the laying of hands is Reiki, right? The fundamental and oft recited prayer of the alternative church was Our Father found in Matthew's Gospel. The Catharist ritual of which two texts have survived demonstrates that they possess ancient documents directly inspired by the primitive Christian community. And the faith of the Cathars did not need a culture priesthood or a church building containing artifacts and relics. Their faith was practiced in their homes and fields. They disdained the need for churches, relics, and sacramentals. Among the Cathars, men and women were considered equals, women even being allowed to inherit and own property, as we have noted, which is what happened in the southeast of the United States. Women were also allowed to preach a practice that had begun in the early Christian community, but it had long since discontinued in Roman Catholicism. This practice among the Cathars reflected the esteem in which the women, including Magdalene, had once held in the infant church because Magdalene was the church. Margaret, hello, wake up, flip everything. It's not about Yahshua. It was never about Yahshua, it's about Magdalene. Cathar preachers, both men and women, traveled the countryside in pairs, just as the early disciples of Yahshua had done in Palestine, sharing the fare of the poor, working side by side with them in fields and preaching the simple and pure life of the spiritually enlightened. St. Dominic and later St. Francis, Francis of Assisi were so impressed with the Cathars' methods of evangelizing converts, they modeled their mendicant friars along these same lines, taking vows of poverty and charity. One extraordinary feature of the Cathars was their insistence that the Bible be translated into their language, the region of Languedoc dialect, and the people taught to read the good news of Jesus in their own tongue. To this end, numerous paper mills sprang up all over the region, giving impetus to the resurrections of art, thought, and letters throughout Provence and later the whole Europe. Cathar children were taught to read, and the girls often became better educated than their male counterparts. Provence 
was an enlightened domain. Too bad we don't have any of these writings left. Let's be clear. What the Cathars were reading is not the same Bible that you have. That's a fact. King James made sure of that. The real Bible is under the Vatican. What we have is satanic. In 2009, the Vatican launched a crusade against the entire region of Provence, including the most nobility of the area, many of whom themselves embraced the Cathar heresy. Aligned with the King of France, the armies of the Pope ravaged the Midi for a generation, their victory culminating in the massacre of Montsieur of Cathar Seminary. There in 1244, an enclave of the siege heretics was defeated, and more than 200 who refused to recount were burned at the stake. Again, I'm saying this is the Salem Witch Trials, you guys. It's the same thing. All the witch trials and what they're talking about with, with the Cathars. If you know the story of King James, this all happened at the same time. Do not pay attention to the dates. The dates are wrong. And they're meant to they're they're wrong on purpose because they're meant to confuse us. The backbone for what is known as Catharism was broke by the Albanian Crusade as the frightful episode is called, and the flowering began in the 12th century, was nipped in the bud. The Inquisition, formally instituted in 1233, ruthlessly interrogated and sentenced heretics, executed thousands. The records of the Inquisition are not always clear as to what heretical beliefs the Church Fathers in Rome found so offensive. In fact, most of the documents of the Albanian heresies were destroyed. They're under the Vatican, y'all. They're not destroyed. Listen. The controllers, they're proud of their work, like serial killers, they take tokens, and so they, they've saved all this stuff. Naturally, it was not the interest of the Vatican and its strong right arm, the Inquisition, to retain documents. That's bullshit. Well, most, most of this is bullshit. In examining the Albigian Crusade from our vantage point, it seems clear that it was an attempt to force an entire region into the orthodoxy of Rome and to destroy, destroy families who resided. Since the deviant thought, culture, and underlying beliefs of Provence were found to be at odds with the orthodox version of faith, every attempt was made to blot them from memory. The truth is that the entire region was opposed for numerous reasons and in numerous ways to the homogeny of the Roman church. We have already discussed one fundamental aspect of this deep-rooted di disenchantment with the established church. The belief that Jesus was married and had heirs was indigenous to Provence. Magdalene was believed to have lived on their soil and to have been buried there, along with her brother, sister, and several close friends. Knows she's buried in Ottawa. The legends and place names of Provence confirmed these beliefs, and so did the secret genealogies of the noble families. Following the Albanian cr Crusade, surviving daughters of the noble families of the Mindi were forced to marry into families in the north, presumably to dissipate the exclusive claims to certain southern families to their special Merovingian bloodline. This was not new. In fact, to consolidate his claim to the throne of the Franks, Charlemagne's father had himself married a Merovingian princess. And you guys know I'm Merovingian. Interesting, like they're talking about the south of France being the home of the Merovingians, but we know the south of France that we know today, no nothing happened there. It was here in the southeast, which is what Egypt is. Canada being Gaul, and I kind of got chills reading that because I'm from this area and I am Merovingian. The flowering of the feminine principle of Provence had once very specific calls that had been overlooked by historians who suggested that the Crusaders brought back the new cultural trends from the Middle East, the adherence to the hidden church of the Grail, believed that it was time to claim their heritage and to make their version of the Christian faith. The king of Jerusalem was Sion of David, which makes him want to vomit. The divinic anointed had been offered the throne of his fathers and the person of Godfrey of Lorraine in the year 1099. Following the naming of Godfrey's. Uh, so as I'm saying that Magdalene's like talking to me because you guys know she's one of my guides. I'm also one of her descendants. And I was also with her when she lived. I won't say how I was. I was related to her, but I won't say how. Um, out of all the people in this community, I'm the only one that's really going through the missing books of the Bible. And she was just telling me this is why. Even though the story isn't really important, even though my soul, your soul, that's what's really important is our souls. In order for karmic justice, I have to be the one to talk about this. This is me getting back what was my history as a Merovingian. 
I am a Merovingian. And the controllers, with the help of people like Margaret Starbird, with their junk conspiracy, have completely obliterated their real history. And so she's telling me that this is my karmic duty, along with many other things, is to rewrite these wrongs. It's disgusting, isn't it? Like, it's just gross. That's why it makes me feel so sick to my stomach when I read about the divinic bloodline. Y'all, that's satanic. If you want to worship the divinic bloodline, that's go right ahead. That's the Rothschilds. Go right ahead. Go to their hunting parties. But if you want to worship the true God, the true source, then wake the fuck up. Stop being so controllable. Stop being so brainwashed. You're better than that. Following the name of the Godfrey's heir to the title of King of Jerusalem, poets became freer with stories and legends of San Graal. And a large number of Grail romances blossomed. The poets residing in the courts of the nobility of Europe were free at last to spin their yarns, broadly hinting at the prestige and role of the Grail family. The stories of Parsifal's search for the Grail were told in every court, and the legends of King Arthur, first written by the 9th century Welsh clerks, were linked to the Grail and began to grow in all sorts of directions. The story of King Arthur is true, you guys. Like, it, that's a true story. It's not, it's not fiction. It has to do with Tartaria. It is occasionally suggested that the earliest version of the Grail story was known to the Moors in Spain and later brought to France, but the original sun Grail of the old French legend is distinctly Christian myth and is much older than the Moors' presence in Spain, much older even than the faith of Islam. It is indigenous to Provence. No, it is not indigenous to Provence. It is indigenous to the southeastern United States. Why do you think there's a huge chiseling chiseled sculpture of Magdalene in the Capitol building of D.C., the Tartarian Capitol building of D.C. Answer me that, Margaret Starbird. In fact, as we have seen, the earliest legends indicate that the Sangreal was brought ashore in AD 42 at Les saint marine de la Mar. Nope. It may later have been associated with the ancient Celtic legend and magical cauldron of Braun, also native to Europe. The Celtic vessel is not called the San Graal. The word San Graal is reserved very specifically to the chalice or vessel that once contained the blood of Christ because the blood of Christ was masculine. And we're going to um, leave it there for now. We're going to pick up next week with the troubadours because this shit gives me such a fucking bad headache that I'm going to have to go a little bit slower through it because it is so unbelievably wrong. And okay, so if this is part of my karmic duty to rewrite my family's history, then that I will do. But you best believe that no matter how many times you lie, the truth will always come out. I know that there's a lot of people out there that are also Merovingians like myself. I know that for a lot of the good truthers in this community, the ones that are not, the, the 10% 10 10 of us that are not bad, most of us are actually Merovingians that I know. I don't know if they know that. I know that. There's a lot that I've been told that I, I can't share. A lot that I've been told that I've been shown. So, let's rewrite these wrongs. Stop falling for the bullshit, guys. Stop it. If it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a fucking duck. Christian church is satanic. The Bible is satanic. The divinic line is satanic. I am in direct opposition. As, as a descendant of the Merovingians, karmically, I am in direct opposition to the cabal. Why do you think I'm so heavily targeted? For the sake of Magdalene, for the sake of every human being who has had their story stolen from them. 
for the sake of our ancestors, for the sake of, sake of the true story of us. Let's right these wrongs. Stop going to your church. Every Sunday you go to church, every time you put money in that, that collection basket, you're just paying for the Rothschilds. You're just paying for more Satanism. Aren't you tired of it? Don't you want to live in freedom? Don't you want to restore your intuitive self? Not one, just because I'm standing here with a public platform as a Merovingian, and I'm not the one that leaked that. The military actually leaked that, that I'm a Merovingian. I knew, though, I knew before they did it, but it's not about me. It's not about Magdalene. It's not about a hierarchy of people. There, There is no one more important than you. We're all equal in the, in the eyes of God. In fact, you are so important, you are so equal, that every time you decide to consent to the controllers, it's affecting the planet. That's how powerful you are. That's why I'm asking you, do your own research. Figure this out. Stop giving money to these horrible people who have destroyed our history. The Divine Feminine is a part of you, too. The Magdalene is a part of you too it's your connection to god it's your god given right to be in full communion with the divine it's your birthright it's who you are you are a fractal of that divinity and every time you consent to the lie every time you consent to these nefarious people you're consenting to the destruction of yourself. Take your power back. You are the princess and princesses of divinity. You are royal. Start acting like it. All right, you guys. We'll pick back up next week with the Troubadours. Mm -hmm.